Welcome back everyone. Today we are going to be talking about selecting equipment for process development and many of you are following along with the process engineering course that we have for our food product developers at Niagara College. So um, this is going to be a bit of fun and a bit of divergence because we've spent the past few weeks doing DMAIC systems. Um, at a certain point, you've got to uh, stop studying things and go and make stuff. <laughs> and we're going to start making stuff here. So today, at the end of this equipment, you'll be able to debate the merits of selecting one's own equipment versus working with a consulting engineering group. <laughs> I'm putting that as my first line because, honestly, I've seen so many small businesses get into a bit of trouble when they're scaling up on their equipment. And so I'm going to lay it out there that in many cases, if you're starting to... Uh, develop a food manufacturing facility, it is worth the money to go and work with a uh, process engineering firm. And if you are going to opt to do your own, I'm going to give you lots of examples of things you should be looking at. You'll be working with an example equipment database to find equipment specifications. We'll overlay equipment specifications onto a process flow and we'll identify manufacturing constraints within the process flow with respect to buffering capacity and uh, considering con continuous processes. And what on earth does that mean? Well, think about making bread, and we will talk about this in a minute, but um, your equipment has to meet the speed of making that product. So many of the different tools that are out there in terms of um, selecting equipment and developing production scheduling is designed for generic manufacturing systems. And that's all very nice. If you're making, if you're making, I don't know, let's say uh, socks, or you're making uh, screws to go into a chair. Well, you can set those socks aside, and nothing goes wrong with those socks if you leave them aside for a couple days. Nothing goes wrong with the screws if you leave them aside for a while. But in the case of food products, you've got a timer that's absolutely critical on this. And you have to be really considerate of the fact that your throughput on your manufacturing has to be absolutely aligned so that you don't have big buffers of food products sitting there potentially spoiling or buffers of food product. Let's say you're making bread where the timing is absolutely essential and you've got bread that's proofing and if you don't bake it within a certain window of time, it's going to overproof and be uh, undesirable to the consumer. So in, in other cases, maybe you're making fish or meat products and you have to move your product between the unit operations extremely e efficiently because you have a thermal process timer on that and you can't expose that product to uh, temperature abuse in between unit operations. If that product is sitting waiting in a tote for a couple hours because equipment's down or equipment is not available because the throughput on that equipment is, is not matching the needs of your product, well, that can be a really considerable problem in food manufacturing. And so many of the generic resources that are out there about um, production scheduling, and we will talk about this in another video, but drum buffer rope concepts of the ability of, of uh, thinking about the throughput of equipment and being able to put um, manufacturing buffers between those pieces of equipment. That doesn't, it works to a certain extent, but it doesn't work in terms of food equipment. So let's start jumping in here and do some of this stuff. So, oh, W. Edwards Deming is here. <laughs> he, he likes to surprise us with encouragement and quotes. So here he is. He's, his quote of the day is, We must preserve the power of intrinsic motivation, dignity, cooperation, curiosity, joy, and learning that people are born with. Oh, well, you can see why I love that quote, because um, as much as W. Edwards Deming focused a lot of his work on manufacturing systems and quality improvement, he also had a strong interest in education systems, and um, he was a big subscriber that any manufacturing organization needs to focus on the, the quality of the human interaction. And 
encouraging people to have joy in learning and pride in work was absolutely essential to a lot of his his um, advocacy that he did through the years. So you can see why I like that quote. So, oh, there's Tiny. Hi, Tiny. Um, let's imagine we're out there going to be selecting equipment. And I've, I've helped a number of small businesses select equipment. It, it, it appears to be so darn easy. You can just go on to Google and start Googling equipment. And you can find it on Alibaba. And, and you can find YouTube videos of equipment vendors. And it seems very, very straightforward. You can go to, um, when, when there's not a pandemic on, you can go to equipment vendor showcases. And many of these showcases are linked to other manufacturing showcases. Um, you can go to used equipment auctions. But I can't stress this enough that you, you have to not just go in there and say, oh, well, there's the equipment I want and put your money down and, and go get a truck and haul your equipment off. There needs to be some really strong consideration and not just going and buying the first thing that you find, taking the time to evaluate the specifications of that product. The, the, the people who've been taking classes with me know how much I like to focus in on what those specifications are stating and really dig in and um, really understand what we're looking at. So First off, before you go about selecting equipment, you've got to have your process in mind and you've got to think about what each of those processing steps is going to be. And honestly, I know the food science students that I teach, making this sort of um, process flow diagram is sort of second nature at this point, but you have to start to overlay that within your mind about what the unit operations are going to look like. And in between each of these steps, what sorts of conveyances, what sort of transportation is necessary? The other piece of the puzzle is what sort of time frame is needed between each process. So if I, I'm going to keep using the making bread ex, um, uh, example, but in each of these steps, there's an exquisitely important time dependence between each of these steps. And in some cases, you also have temperature dependence and environmental dependence that you have relative. So, for example, you're making bread, that mixing and uh, proofing step, you, you can't mix it and leave it overnight. You may need to be mixing it and cooking it off immediately, or you may need to be mixing it and then proofing it. You need to really take time to hone in on each of the manufacturing variables that could be influencing the, the quality of your product. And you need to go in there and start to consider where can we form buffers where we can hold product and that work in progress is stable over time. Whereas in other cases, we need to know where work in progress must continue to flow consistently because we can't, we can't hold that work in progress. So for example, if you're making bread, you can hold the flour in the storage area for a period of time. Once the bread is baked, at the cooling point, you can hold it for an intermediate amount of time, perhaps a day or so, but you want to get it out the door and sold. If you hold it too, too long, it's going to be stale and undesirable to the consumer and your shelf life will be up. But on the front end, your raw ingredients, you can hold those um, up to the stated shelf life in theory. Um, some of the ingredients may have to have uh, higher throughput, but honestly, once you have mixed that dough, the timer starts. You can't sit and let that dough proof overnight unless that's your specification. If it's meant to have a one hour proofing, you can't let it go for six hours because it will be a spoiled product. So you need to really consider that as part of your process flow when selecting for equipment. And that, that select, why? why? Because when, when you've got those sorts of continuous operations that flow from one to the next to the next, and the timing is absolutely critical, it begs the question, one, whether you should be working with a single equipment vendor, oftentimes within, um, within manufacturing consortium, they'll be able to build out a package of equipment that's going to have that uh, continuity between one unit to the next. Or the second piece of the puzzle is 
uh, from that continuity perspective, you may be building out a continuous system where each of those units is linked up with conveyances, uh, belts, etc., so that you, you are timing the entire system based off of one control. So, as I just mentioned, it does make sense in some cases to buy from an integrated manufacturing system uh, organization. So, for example, if I was if I was doing a, a bread product, do I buy my mixer, my proofer, my uh, dough portioner, my conveyances, and my continuous oven from a single manufacturing group? Because then I'll be able to um, control the uh, the throughput on my manufacturing and be able to balance that throughput appropriately? Or do I instead piece things together because honestly, the, the cost, if I go in comparison shop across different, different manufacturers, in many cases, I may be able to get my mixer cheaper from one group and my dough portioner cheaper from a second group, but I may not have that same um, continuity. So I can't, I can't stress enough that on the short term, you may have a higher cost when you're buying in an integrated system, whereas in the long term, you will have maintenance and interoperability issues, and you may not have balanced throughput on that, on that equipment. And so do be cautious there. Now, let's, let's do an example process here. So I've got my process flow diagram, and let's say I've got uh, initially, uh, oh, this is bread, surprise. I've got my raw materials, I've got my, um, flour, yeast, and water going in, and it's going into a large spiral mixer. And then that spiral mixer, as you can see, there's a, uh, a large bucket on there on a, on a wheelie cart. <laughs> and I can move that cart into the proofing room for one hour. I can then pop it back in the mixer, knock it back, put it back in the proofing room for 30 minutes. And then it's going to go to my dough portioner here. This is a VMAG dough portioner. So We've got a, a lift cart that's going to tip that bucket into the hopper here. And then the hopper is going to portion off my dough onto a conveyance. It's then going to go into tins and onto the speed carts. And those speed carts will then be transferred to uh, a gas rotary oven here. And then the speed carts pulled out and sent to a cooling zone. So that's all fine and good. I've, uh, I can think about those different operations and pardon me, I'm just going to go right out. I always joke we're friends at this point and I'm not going to edit this out. Oh, hi, W. Edward Stemming. Um, there are different databases out there that sell equipment. Uh, I'm, I'm not bound to one or another, but it just happens that Foodmaster has a half decent industrial database. Oftentimes, if you are following many of the trade magazines, um, uh, I'm just thinking of the meeting place. Let's find that web page for you. Meeting place. Meeting place has a trade journal for meat processing. They've got tons and tons of uh, database information. Oh, why is my internet slow today? Waiting, waiting, waiting. You can see why I go for asynchronous because this is how fast my internet is. <laughs> waiting for, let's see if I can find Baker's Journal. Baker's Journal. This is a, a baking magazine for the Canadian industry, and they've got different resources in terms of being able to source equipment manufacturers. There's a right there on the on the top of their website. They've got um, Unifiller. They do filling equipment, and so if you want to portion dough, uh, not portion dough portion um, pie fillings or whip toppings or, or so on. They have an automated filler or a semi-automated filler that will do that for you. you. Oftentimes, the different industrial journals for different commodities will have um, ingredient, or ingredient and or equipment databases for all of the different equipment that is relative to the industry. Meeting Place, they've got their own for meat, uh, they got meat fuller trucks and meat, uh, meat transportation equipment. And honestly, it's, it's worth following these journals to start to get a name brand recognition for the different pieces of equipment. Uh, Foodmaster just happens to have 
um, more general plant equipment and you can go in there and uh, take a look at some of the different equipment vendors that are out there to see what they've got. Um, something else that's worth noting in here is that they do have engineering design and construction service referrals as well. So you can connect with some of those. If you are in industry, I do highly recommend that you connect with um, some of the organizations like the, the Technology Access Centers. Niagara College just happens to have a food and beverage technology access center. Um, and the uh, expert staff that are there can help connect you with equipment vendors. Or if you are not connected, um, here in Canada, we also have um, what's called the Industrial Research Assistance Program, IRAP, and they have their uh, ITA program, the in Industrial Technology Advisor Program, and they have um, technology specialists who can help you connect with some of the different uh, suppliers that are out there. It just happens that Foodmaster has some of the um, engineering firms that do process engineering for food manufacturing, and they are all listed here. Anytime you're accessing different services of this sort, I highly recommend getting multiple opinions. Don't go and get a hundred, but get a few different opinions from um, providers that are regional to you and get different quotes for services. And the same with equipment. Get multiple products, do comparisons of their technical specifications to be able to identify what's appropriate. And then you can compare the technical specifications against the price point. So let's jump back to the slideshow here, and I'm not going to edit this. Out. All right, so we we've we've gone through the database. We found some different equipment that we want to work with, and let's just imagine. Let's say uh, we're doing thousand kilo batches of bread at any point in time. So let's say we've got a thousand kilo batch, and we're going to be kneading it for twenty minutes and proofing it uh, for an hour. And we can continue that 1,000 kilo because it's in that conveyance tote. And then let's say it goes to the door, dough portioner. And this is where looking at the specifications of that equipment is important. Let's say that dough portioner is only able to handle 200 kilos per hour. Well, that is going to be a problem because we will need five hours throughput on that dough portioner to be able to handle that 1,000 kilo batch. So it begs the question, do we buy five dough portioners? Can we find a bigger dough portioner that's capable of handling a thousand kilos in the time frame that's necessary so that the quality on the front end um, of that dough portioning is going to be the same as the quality on the back end of that dough portioning? Then let's say the proofing is quite capable of handling a thousand kilos, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that we may have lag from start to finish. Can we make sure that the dough that was portioned at the beginning and proofed at the beginning then gets baked off first so that we are tagging the time on that appropriately and baking it off? Then let's say we've got a, a gas fed rotary oven and it's capable of uh, doing batch base of a thousand kilos per batch or not a thousand, a hundred kilos per batch. So now we've got a mismatch in terms of the throughput. Do we buy 10 of those uh, ovens or do we find a piece of equipment that's got a different throughput so that we can match what's what's going on here? So let's let's just summarize that here. We've got a thousand kilos on our on our spiral dough mixer, 200 kilos on our portioner and 100 kilos on our on our oven. It begs the question, should we <laughs> you can just see the problem with with going with this model where you've got to instead buy five of these dough portioners and ten of these ovens and all of the ancillary and just imagine all of the people necessary to be running around and doing this and that's going to uh, make your labor costs absolutely skyrocket. So this is something that I caution many different small businesses on is that do we really, really cognizant of what the throughput volume is on the different pieces of equipment to make sure that you are balancing the throughput across the entire process? So instead, let's in, rather than having a thousand kilo spiral, spiral mixer, let's do a one hundred kilo spiral spiral mixer. Now the misbalance is in the center point, but is it a big issue if we're only running this, let's say, for a half hour and leaving it idle? 
while we wait for the next batch. And in this case, it's likely not critical if we are leaving it idle for a period of time between batches. And we've got a better balance down here in terms of now we've got 100 kilos and we've got a 100 kilo batch carrying forward. Now, what, it, what if instead we were to get something like this, where we've got a thousand kilo throughput on our spiral mixer here. Let's say we've got a huge VMAG capable of dealing with a tote of a thousand kilos and the throughput on it is adequate for what we need. But then let's say we get in a, a continuous belt oven that's capable of doing 5,000 kilos per period of time, let's say per hour. Here's the thing, we may be only batching off a thousand kilos and a thousand kilos here. The cost on getting this oven heated up, even though the capacity is quite capable of handling that product, um, the cost of heating it up doesn't make sense if we're only going to be making thousand kilo batches. And so we were heating up this huge oven and blasting our product through and then shutting that oven off. And the startup costs on that equipment are going to be quite high and it's going to add up to our operating cost. So instead, let's see, do we completely balance the entire system so that we've got thousand here, a thousand here, and a thousand here. This is a this is an ideal situation, but it doesn't give a lot of opportunity for growth. And so this is that constant tension that is interplaying by food manufacturers who are in the process of building out equipment, um, building out equipment specifications and building out facilities is that give and take back and forth constantly about what size equipment, how much do you invest? And then of course it goes back to uh, cost amortization. If, if we're making thousand kilo batches, but we're a corner bakery and only going to have a hundred people coming through on foot traffic, can we somehow amplify our sales so that we can either get efficient use on this equipment and amortize that cost uh, in a timely fashion? Or does it even make sense to go this route? I see a lot of small business uh, get stuck in a feedback loop at this point. And this is where having um, the chance to consult with a uh, consulting engineer makes sense. You can do a lot of that legwork yourself, sourcing equipment and finding that equipment, but having an engineer in your team as a consultant to help align the equipment and make sure that it's... Um, that that throughput is balanced is worthwhile. And in some cases, the equipment manufacturer, especially if you're buying new equipment, will do some of this work with you because they see the value in the, in the, in the sale of that equipment to you. And so they'll help you select based off of the sales projections and the, the um, process flow that you have described for your product. Now, something else that's worth being aware of for your product uh, or for your equipment, pardon me, when going out and selecting equipment, as I mentioned before, it's just so darn easy to go onto Alibaba and say, oh, well, there's a there's a spiral mixer for making dough. Fantastic. It's so cheap. If I buy it in from offshore, it's way cheaper than buying equipment from in Canada or in the United States. And what I have to caution you on is that in many cases, equipment that's per purchased from offshore does not have the certifications that's necessary for immediate use within Canada. And so you have to go through additional certifications on that equipment before you can have it signed off for use in your facility. So for example, let's say we bought that spiral mixer from, I don't uh, let's say we bought it from China. Well, first thing we'd have to do is get uh, CSA and TSSA certification on that equipment. And so these are um, in the in terms of CSA, that's an electrical um, electrical certification. TSSA is going to look at sanitary welding and in in any pipes or any pressure fittings that the pressure fittings are going to be compliant for North American manufacturing. In some cases, um, those sanitary welds need to be absolutely um, audited on every single weld and you have to have an audit of who who welded those welds and um, what sort of quality checks they did on each of the welds that were done on your equipment. This is why 
equipment sold in North America and Europe is more expensive because this level of expectation on safety is necessary. You may have additional NSF or ANSI or uh, UL requirements. NSF is um, an organization that uh, many of our food scientists know because they also do audit services and food safety. But um, historically, NSF uh, used to stand for, it's now, it's now a consolidated acronym, but it used to be uh, the National Sanitation Foundation, and they would do equipment inspections. ANSI is the American National, uh, National Standards Institute, and they are doing similar. Underwriters Lab is the last one here, and they are checking the safety and the integrity of different types of equipment that are brought into North America for manufacturing operations. Then another one that's that's quite common that I see problematic is where, especially if, if folks are looking at online auctions for equipment and you find an old school piece of equipment from, I don't know, the 1960s that has been kicking around in the, the, the junk room of some manufacturer and the manufacturer just wants to liquidate it and they try on the auction scene first. They may not have the appropriate machine guarding what I mean by machine guarding is that uh, any moving parts or any um, blades or chains or belts, any gearboxes, etc., are covered appropriately so, so that workers are not going to get their arms or clothing caught in that piece of equipment. And so machine guarding is absolutely critical. We, we can't stress this enough. You need to make sure that the equipment that you're working with is protecting the workers in a really safe way. So... Make sure that you're not just getting some random piece of equipment and implementing it in your facility. The Ministry of Labor could have a really hard time and uh, uh, create a lot of problems for you. Another one is sanitation teardown and reassembly. And honestly, this is um, I'm raising this issue because of the maple leaf issue that happened in 2008. This was one of the key findings that you need to be able to easily tear apart that equipment and reassemble that equipment without needing specialist mechanics or specialist engineers to come out and use equipment or um, let's say fancy screwdrivers or drills or whatever to be able to tear down and reassemble that equipment. For the types of sanitation that are necessary to prevent cross-contamination of your product, a general worker should be able to do the teardown and reassembly of that equipment with minimal hand equipment. And ideally, they should be able to just do it with hand screws. Um, it's absolutely critical to know where the sorts of blind ends, bearings, hollow points, and so on that bacteria could be harboring in are going to be hiding in that equipment. And so be really aware. In North America, for the most part, um, most industrial manufacturing equipment is really cognizant of all of these sorts of blind spots in manufacturing where bacteria would like to hide. Whereas in other uh, jurisdictions, it's improving. It's improving year on year, but there's nothing stopping people from just going into their garage and manufacturing equipment and putting it up on online platforms for sale. And I, I get that that level of ingenuity is fantastic, but where would bacteria want to hide? And is it going to become a problem in your manufacturing system? So, uh, for example, I remember working with an equipment manufacturer and they wanted to use uh, braided steel cable for moving parts. And we had to switch that out to um, rubber belts for the moving parts because the braided steel cable is, as you can guess, it's a braided cable and bacteria could embed themselves within that cable and in a moist processing environment, while stainless braided cable seems like an ideal um, piece of material to work with, the bacteria could be hiding inside that cable. And then when uh, doing sanitation, you could be washing that bacteria out and onto additional surfaces. You do want to be aware of any sort of stainless steel grades that you're working with. Again, there are different types of stainless steel grades for the types of uh, materials that you're working with. So are you working with high acid foods, uh, fruit juices, wines, etc., or are you working with, with meat? The different grades and the different passivization treatments that are on different stainless are going to be relative to the types of materials stored in those. 
And as I said before, welds and weld audits are absolutely critical on any sort of pressure vessel. So if you're holding uh, bulk liquids in large tanks, you need to have those welds and weld audits on file for uh, TSSA certification. So lots of complexity in selecting equipment. And I, I can't stress this enough that in many cases, it's worth retaining an uh, engineering firm to at least do some validation on the work that you're doing because the Ministry of Labor is involved in this, CFIA in Canada could be involved in this. You want to make sure that you are um, selecting equipment that's got the right throughput balance so that you're not shifting that balance and ending up with product spoiling because you don't have the throughput um, adequately allocated in your manufacturing system. And last but not least, I can't stress this enough, the equipment's got to be safe. It's got to be safe. It's got to be safe. So it may be worth as much as you can do some of this work researching on your own. There is value in retaining an engineering design firm uh, to validate the work that you're doing and to ensure that you've got safe equipment in place and you're not going to harm people either from a food safety perspective or from an equipment failure perspective. All right. So lots of lots of content there, very interesting topic, and I'll leave it there. I always enjoy hearing your questions. I love getting your ideas for next videos. I do have some next videos that I want to do, but I've got to get my uh, course videos up first. But I um, always love hearing from you, hearing your questions, hearing your comments, and I love the fact that you are continuing on your learning journey in food science. All right, take care. We'll talk to you soon.